One is Watson, which we might even call the, the, the heir of Deep Blue because he was made by the same parents, the IBM uh, company. And Watson was a computer that a couple of years ago uh, didn't just beat the best humans at chess, they beat the, beat the best humans at a game called Jeopardy. Some of you have probably seen that. It's a United States game show where you have to use real language and, and, and puns and, and, and you, you, you think it's the kind of thing that a machine couldn't do because you have to be creative in coming up with answers. And Watson beat the three best world Jeopardy players in a match on, on, on TV. And this was seen by many again as uh, proof of that computers were becoming smarter and more creative and more thoughtful thinking than humans. Watson is now um, going to medical school. I don't know how many of you know this. Um, but uh, IBM, working with a number of hospitals and also with Ray Kurzweil and his company, New former company, Nuance Technologies, is having Watson read the entire history of medical science and process it. And the idea is that Watson will become the greatest diagnostic doctor in the world. Um, you know, you'll, you'll type in your symptoms, you'll hear everything, you'll give the test results, and Watson will say there's an 82% chance of this, and a 72% chance of this, and he'll give you the different diagnoses based on folk remedies, and you know, who knows, uh, voodoo, but also based on Western science and, and Chinese medicine and everything else. And um, IBM is very careful to say, look, don't worry doctors. I mean, Watson is simply a tool for doctors. He's not going to replace you. But you have to think about how ingenuous or disingenuous that claim is. I don't know how many of you know what medical school entails, but it entails people staying up very long hours, memorizing you know, enormous amounts of information that five years when they're out of medical school is largely out of date today. And the effort that we put our doctors through to, to learn all this is so that they can become diagnosticians. But if Watson knows it all, and they all are able to carry Watson around in their pocket, we have to ask how worth it is going to be for these doctors to continue to learn all this stuff. Wouldn't it be better to do what Kasparov says with chess? Well, let the machine do all that, and we'll be sort of the creative people on top. But when you're the creative person on top and you can't check the machine and you don't know all the facts the machine knows, you become incredibly dependent upon the machine. And one wonders how much longer we will be creating doctors who are in charge of the tools that they are currently using. Another example of this is there's new surgeries being done with joysticks. And you know they say, oh, well, it's OK, it's a laser and it's a joystick, but the doctor's still in control. Yes, sort of. We've also programmed the machines so that if the doctor slips or makes a move, the machine catches it and stops it. Right? So at what point, who's in control? Um, in any case, uh, that's, the, that's the machine Watson. Here's a machine that I bet most of you haven't heard of. His name is Aaron. I don't know where they come up with all the names. But. Um, Aaron is an artist. He was created by uh, an artist in San Diego, a computer scientist artist named Harold Cohen. And, um, you know, I bring this up because if we think chess and Jeopardy are creative, and being a diagnostician is being creative and thinking, there's probably no human endeavor that is more identified with creativity than art. And here is Aaron, who has been over 25 years learning how to paint, teaching himself how to paint. He started with algorithms that taught him how to do basic lines and close lines and do these things, and you can read all about it. But he has become a painter. And these are some of Aaron's paintings, which um, are these days exhibited in places like the Brooklyn Museum, the Ontario Science Center, the Boston Science Museum, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Tate Gallery in London, and more. No one told Aaron what to paint. They just put a canvas in front of him and turn him on, and that's one of the things he paints. Now, you may like it, you may not, but many of you probably would not have known that it was painted by 
a computer without any human input as to what this computer was to paint. Um, it can, for many people, and it has in many tests with art critics, pass what's called a Turing test. Does anyone know what a Turing test is? A Turing test is, uh, it was developed by a man named Alan Turing. The idea is, how do you know when a computer is human, or when it has consciousness, or when it's alive in a certain sense? And what Turing said is, you put a computer on one side of a screen, and the humans on the other, and they type a conversation. And if the computer can type in such a way that you don't know that it's a computer, you think it's human, and answer your questions, then even though it's not human, right, clearly not, it seems human, and acts human, and thus we treat it as human, and that's called the Turing test. Well, Aaron has passed the Turing test, in the sense that people look at his artwork and can't tell whether it's human or not. Um, just like the people at IBM, and just like Kasparov, Cohen, the creator of Aaron, is very clear that Aaron is not creative. He says, and this is Cohen and, and, uh, and a guy named Kurzweil, who we'll talk about in a second, Ray Kurzweil. But Cohen says, I have never claimed in fact, I've never in fact claimed that Aaron is a creative program. Right? He's just a computer. He works according to programs and algorithms. He can't think. And yet he can create work that is human quality work, at least in the sense that we can't tell the difference. Um, what Kasparov says is don't worry. It's gonna, there's still, humans will still be at the top. These are just machines. <coughs> what IBM says is don't worry, doctors will still be in charge. <coughs> what Cohen says is, oh, don't worry, he's just a machine, he's not creative. Artists are still different. Stanley Fish, who is a, is a literary and legal critic and writes very often in the New York Times, wrote a couple of years ago about Watson that um, Watson is just a big and powerful version of Stanley Fish's laptop computer with a huge database. Again, the point is, don't worry. These are just tools. But I want to suggest to you that, and people today with MOOCs say, don't worry, they're not going to replace education, they're just tools to help make it better. The question is, at what point does the advance of these tools, when they can pass a Turing test, when they can act in such a way that we can't tell that they're not human, at what point does this actually threaten to make humans irrelevant or replace us, or where is the place, what is the place of humanity in this coming age? In short, Aaron and Watson and these other computers dare us to believe the illusion, that the illusion that they think is real, and that the machine's algorithms are human. They dare us to believe that they actually act like humans do. And this itself is important. Even if machines will never become fully human, right? A question I can't answer. Even if we'll never create a machine or we'll never reverse engineer the brain, again, I don't know if we will or not. The point is that the fact that many machines now act in ways that we think of as human, to me, matters. If the computer successfully convinces the human judge of the illusion that it is another person, we treat it as another person and we lose the distinction between humans and machines.